Hi, I'm Andy, and in this video we'll be exploring how to attack, detect, and defend against the abuse of Windows services. In a previous video, I spoke about PSExec, a nifty tool which uses file sharing to transfer some executable code, and a Windows service to launch it. That video is focused on the first part, the, the file sharing. So in this video I wanted to dig a bit deeper into Windows services, both the remote management capability which PSExec uses, and also some abuses that can occur locally. Windows services are programs which are wrapped up in a few specific functions to allow them to be started and stopped via Windows' Service Control Manager, rather than via user interaction. This strawman code, generated by Visual Studio's .NET Service Wizard, shows the two main functions triggered by the Service Control Manager. OnStart contains the code to be run when the service starts. This will usually involve spawning one or more new threads to do whatever the service is meant to do. And OnStop contains the code to gracefully terminate those threads and tidy up. There's a great article on MSDN which walks through the creation of a simple service, and I'd recommend giving it a go yourself if you'd like to understand about the inner workings of services in even more detail. Check the video description for links. Before a service can be used, it must be registered with the Service Control Manager. This installation process records several key pieces of information, such as the name of the service, a description, the path to the service's executable file, and whether the service should be started automatically when the system starts. Installation and removal of services requires administrative rights on the machine, and in general, as does starting and stopping most services, although the permissions model supports much finer grain permissions in order to allow non-privileged users to perform some actions on some services. See the Service Security and Access Rights documentation link in the description for more details. The Windows Services GUI provides a friendly mechanism for viewing, starting, and stopping services. It's also possible to interact with the Service Control Manager on the command line via SC. The Services GUI and SC are two examples of service control programs. They don't actually do the starting and stopping of services themselves, remember that's the role of the Service Control Manager. Rather, they are sending requests to the Service Control Manager via the Windows API. The SCM also has the ability to send requests to other computers over a network via remote procedure call over TCP port 445. This gets handled by the remote machine's service control manager. One final thing to note is that the service control manager stores its configuration in the registry under HKEY LOCAL MACHINE SYSTEM CURRENT CONTROL SET SERVICES. Windows services can be abused in a bunch of different ways by attackers. One of the most obvious is as a form of persistence. After all, one of the big reasons that services even exist is to automatically run certain code whenever the system starts up, so this seems like a really great place for an attacker to place their own code to ensure it survives between reboots. As we saw before, creating a service is trivial once an attacker has access to a machine, even if it's just via a command prompt. But in some scenarios, an attacker might not want their code to run immediately on startup. Uh, perhaps they want to be a bit more subtle and only run their code under certain circumstances. Event triggers offer a way of doing this, such as when a particular type of hardware device is connected, or when a particular network event occurs. I'm not going to dig into service triggers in much more detail in this video, but there's a link in the description for further information. Aside from creating a new service, an attacker might also choose to modify an existing service. Repointing a service to the attacker's own code still acts as a form of persistence, but this time with the added camouflage of hiding under a name which the system administrators would expect to see. Here I've modified one of the genuine VMware services to point to a different executable. An attacker might also modify an item if they just want to interfere with the operation of a genuine service and cause a denial of service condition. A more subtle method of persistence is to set up a trigger to run malicious code when an error event occurs on a service. The benefit here is that a cursory glance at the services and their executables shows nothing out of the ordinary. The attacker's payload is hidden deeper in the service configuration. The downside, however, is that this only gets run if the service exits with an error, so an attacker must find a sufficiently buggy service to target if this variation on service abuse is to actually be useful. So, that's a few methods of persistence, 
but services can also be used to achieve privilege escalation. Services can be configured to run under any particular user account, and best practice dictates that they should run with the least privileges possible. To that end, Windows provides three service-specific accounts that can be used. Local service, network service, and local system. The last of these, local system, holds system-level privileges, greater than that of an administrator user account. Although an administrator can create a service to run with local system privileges in order to elevate their access up to system. I mentioned earlier that the Service Control Manager uses the Windows Registry to store service configuration options. That makes it possible to bypass the Service Control Manager altogether to add or modify the operation of services by changing registry values. Here I'm changing the executable that's run for one service and entirely removing another service altogether by deleting a key. Everything we've discussed so far has been in the context of an attacker who has already achieved code execution on a machine. But it's important to acknowledge that many attackers have been observed using the remote management capabilities of Service Control Manager to undertake lateral movement across a network and achieve initial code execution on their next target device. As I mentioned in the intro, the PS exec tool provided as part of the sysinternal suite is one mechanism for automating the steps in an easy way, although an attacker could just as easily run the SC command to perform the same actions themselves manually. All of these attack vectors require an attacker to have already achieved local administrator privileges. But before we move on to detection and defensive measures, I just wanted to highlight that there's also methods to attack services using a non-admin account if a service suffers from an unquoted path vulnerability and weak file system permissions. Check out my video on path interception for more on that. A manual examination of the service's GUI or SC command output can provide a means to identify a sloppily created malicious service, but it can be hard to sometimes spot one suspicious entry amongst such a large list. And most attackers will try and blend in by using technical sounding names, or names similar to genuine services. Autoruns, part of the Sysinternals package, can provide a friendlier view with some added features, such as hiding normally expected system services, and highlighting in pink any services which link to code that doesn't have a valid digital signature. It also has the ability to undertake a comparison against a previous analysis. Green items are new additions, red items are changes or removals. While this comparison can be really effective at spotting changes to services, it relies on having performed an earlier analysis and storing the results. This kind of comparison activity can work well to spot where a new service is being used for persistence. However, some attackers may remove their service if their intent is just a one-off code execution. The PS exec tool does exactly this. So if a malicious service is removed, we have to turn to event logs to find any trace that it existed. Event ID 7045 in the system log records the fact the service was installed, referencing the name and path to the executable. There doesn't appear to be an equivalent event for the removal of a service, however, and this minimal level of login can be further circumvented by an attacker directly reading and writing to the Service Control Manager's registry entries. Some additional login comes in the form of event ID 7036, which records the starting and stopping of a service, although this has unfortunately been removed from desktop flavors of Windows, and is only generated on server operating systems. Another good option is to monitor the registry itself for changes. I've had Sysmon running with the Swift on Security rule set throughout this video, and here I'm applying a filter to show all the registry related events. We can pick out events related to some of the changes made via SC, and also those from direct registry access. Windows itself can also perform registry monitoring, if object auditing is turned on and configured for the relevant keys through the auditing permissions interface within regedit. Once set up, events are generated in the security log for changes and deletions. Here we can see the old and new values for the service executable which I modified via regedit earlier. 
Services are part of the core operation of Windows, so it's understandably difficult to write rules to distinguish between genuine and malicious activity, and reliably block the bad stuff. However, some more advanced endpoint protection software, such as Microsoft Defender ATP, can detect and block patterns of activity which may be malicious based on intelligence feeds and knowledge of prior attack chains. This could include the malicious abuse of services under certain conditions. Most of the attack scenarios around the abuse of Windows services require admin level privileges. So one key defensive measure is to ensure such privileges are granted only sparingly. In tandem, good general hygiene around file permissions is important to ensure that low privilege users can't overwrite genuine service executables. Finally, the lateral movement vector of remote service creation depends on remote procedure calls. So, as mentioned in the previous video on the abuse of Windows shares, treat any workstation to workstation traffic as suspicious and consider blocking it. And of course, absolutely ensure that Windows file sharing ports are not internet exposed. But that about wraps up this video. If you found it useful, please do give it a like and consider subscribing if you want more of this sort of content. Drop a note in the comments if there's anything you think I missed around attacking, detecting and defending against the abuse of Windows services, or if you have a good idea of what topic I should cover next. I'll see you next time.